Okay, this is Alan DeLuna. And thank you all for waiting for us. We've got a next Glenn Extra. And the first thing we're going to be doing is talking about 80 years of the Glenn Research Center, pushing boundaries and breaking barriers. We've already had a couple of really nice videos and some presentations about the capability of Glenn. But now we've got Ann Mills, the record manager for NASA Glenn Research Center, going to bring us some more information about the wonderful things that Glenn has done in the past and what it might do in the future. So Ann, take us away. All right, and my slides up. I see a beautiful coastline. There we go. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm sure many of you have heard that we are celebrating our 80th anniversary this year. Uh, and as you can imagine, we have accomplished quite a lot of, uh, in those years. So today I'm just going to give like the highlight reel history and then bring it all together as to what that means for us today. All right, next slide. All right, so jumping right into it, Glenn is one of the original centers that was part of NASA's predecessor agency, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. So we're actually older than NASA itself. Uh, and the NACA was a small agency charged with studying the problems of flight and coming up with practical solutions. They were founded in 1915 and focused primarily on like just general aerodynamics, the aircraft itself, that by, by the late 1930s, they determined that, hey, we need a laboratory that really just focuses on aircraft engines because planes cannot fly any faster or any higher if you do not have better engines. So a team of prominent Cleveland businessmen successfully sold Cleveland as the ideal location for the NACA's aircraft engine research lab. And here we have them breaking ground uh, on January 23rd, 1941. All right, next slide. Now, the original intent for this new aircraft engine research lab was to do like real cutting edge stuff, push the envelope. But the U.S. being pulled into World War II in 1941 meant that we needed to be up and running ASAP to support the war effort. So the cutting edge stuff got shelved for a minute um, while we um, the first few years of our existence was to solve problems associated with current piston engines being used by the military. So enhancing performance with like superchargers, fuel combustion, different types of fuels, um, how to cool engines that are now running hotter because of higher performance, different materials, different lubricants that allow the engine to perform at even higher tolerances. Um, and here we have um, the initiation of test operations in May of 1942. So we got up and running pretty fast, I think. All right, next slide. And when the war ended, we were finally able to get back to that cutting edge research we were intended to do all along. Uh, we quickly transitioned from that wartime technology of piston engines to the emerging field of jet propulsion, missiles, rockets, and supersonics. And this paved the way for work in turbines, heat transfer, uh, high energy fuels. And in 1948, we were renamed to the Lewis Flight Propulsion Research Laboratory to memorialize George Lewis. Everyone was like, who was Lewis? Uh, he was the NACA's first director of aeronautical research and he was really instrumental in having our labs established. All right, so next slide. And so this new direction set the stage for us to build a name in high energy propulsion. So next logical step from jets is missiles, you know, your, I'm sorry, rockets, you know, you just turn them the other way. Um, and our early rocket group decided we were going to build a niche for ourselves in liquid rocket propellants. And very early on, we developed a very high opinion of liquid hydrogen. Um, and that will be relevant again in a couple slides. Um, at this time, we also added nuclear propulsion to our portfolio, so we became involved in research for a nuclear-powered aircraft, later transitioned to nuclear power for spacecrafts. Um, and so in order to expand our research capabilities, the center built NASA's first and only uh, nuclear test facility, a nuclear reactor, and this is how we came to acquire 
our facility out in Sandusky, the Armstrong Test Facility, previously known as Plumbrook Station. Okay, next slide. Okay, in 1958, we make another huge transition with the formation of NASA. So some people, you could argue that NASA was born at Lewis uh, based on recommendations from two Lewis leaders, Abe Silverstein and Bruce London. NASA was built on the foundation of the NACA. So all three existing NACA labs were absorbed into the new space agency and we were renamed NASA Lewis Research Center. Uh, and this is like my favorite picture ever because they just literally just painted over the sea, put up the S, like super efficient. Um, and as a point of trivia, uh, the NASA meatball logo. So like one of the most iconic graphic designs of all time was designed here at Lewis by an artist named Jim Motorelli. All right, next slide. So at this time, most of our aeronautics work was suspended to support the new space program and the pressures of the space race. And we had a role to play in the new Mercury program. So we were responsible for the Mercury capsule separation system and the escape tower rockets. We also tested the retro rocket thrusters that would stabilize the spacecraft to make sure it was oriented correctly for re-entry. And we did this by creating this cool contraption here called the Mastiff. It was like a giant gyroscope. Um, but there was no backup for this system. So someone had the brilliant idea of, let's put the astronauts in this thing too, to make sure they can do it themselves manually if it just, you know, in case the system failed. So all seven Mercury astronauts came to Lewis to uh, take their turn in this test, stud um, you know, studying a simulated spiraling out of control spacecraft. So, um, and this is the only time that John Glenn ever like worked here. Um, so here's a photo of him. Uh, he's smiling. So I suspect it was before he took his turn. Um, another quick trivia. So John Glenn was never employed here, but Neil Armstrong actually was. So this was his first uh, NASA job. It was still an ACA at that point. But he only worked here for like four months and we obviously did not know he was going to be famous. So we don't have any pictures of him uh, while he worked here, but we do have John Glenn. All right, next slide. Uh, so it was definitely our most impactful contribution to the success of the early space program was the Centaur program. So this is where our liquid hydrogen expertise picks up. Centaur was a liquid hydrogen powered upper stage rocket that was needed to take the surveyor probes to the moon so you could scout out our landing sites for Apollo. Famously being managed by Dr. Werner von Braun in Huntsville, and it was not going well. Uh, von Braun said liquid hydrogen is no good, we need to start over. Um, but our guy, uh, Abe Silverstein, he knew that liquid hydrogen was the best choice. He knew that our experts at Lewis could get this back on track, and he convinced headquarters to transfer the program to us. And that's exactly what we did. We turned it around to an overwhelming success, uh, still used today to launch commercial payloads. And for decades, since no one knew Centaur as well as we did, um, we managed all Centaur launches. So including missions like Pioneer and Mariner, uh, we did payload integration, shroud separation testing, trajectory design, launch day operations. And this was a really big deal for a research center because it showed we could do project management just as well. All right, next slide. And so Centaur was not simply like just perfecting the rocket, but also the related factors like the challenge of how is fuel going to behave in the microgravity of space? So how do you store and pump, ignite, and just like generally control liquid fuels in microgravity? Those are all unknown. So at this time, we built our first microgravity facilities to give us the ability to test um, for up to 5.2 seconds of reduced gravity from the comforts of Earth. And this became the foundation for our continued research in microgravity science. Um, which we are still do today with the emphasis on fluid and flame behaviors. All right, next slide. 
All right, and in addition to the manned space side of things, in the 60s, we also greatly expanded our advanced propulsion efforts, primarily uh, in electric propulsion, useful for long duration exploration missions. Uh, the ion engine was developed here at that time, and we had the first successful demonstration of an electric propulsion technology in space in 1964. Uh, in addition to the engines themselves, we also see growth of space power and energy conversion. So researchers here made improvements to early solar cells, as well as thermonuclear applications for space power. All right, next slide. All right, so heading into the 70s, we faced some challenges, mostly a declining budget. We did not get any slices of the new shuttle program pie. Um, but we did find success in applying some of our aerospace skills to environmental problems emerging on Earth. So one of the unforeseen kind of outcomes of the space program was the environmental movement. Like we had a new appreciation for Earth because we, we saw just how fragile it was. The energy crisis of the time also created demand for research in renewable energy sources. And you know, having an expertise in energy conversion, turbines, that made us a natural fit for this kind of work. So probably most um, notable was our extensive wind turbine research. So we built a number of experimental wind turbines to test the effectiveness of different configurations. Uh, the legacy of this research lives on in today's wind energy industry, still very prevalent. Um, our solar cell and battery research was applied to development of solar powered electric systems to serve remote areas that couldn't be serviced by the traditional grid system and also investigated improved batteries for electric cars. All right, next slide. All right, and at this time, we're also able to get back to the first A in NASA and refocus our efforts in aeronautical research. Um, so by now, there's new problems to solve uh, because commercial aviation has grown tremendously, uh, whereas previously our focus had been on military applications. Um, some of the issues we took on were engine efficiency and noise reduction. Tremendous growth in airports and air traffic was becoming problematic. So we were looking at um, engines and integration for vertical and short takeoff and landing aircraft, technologies for quieter engines and more energy efficient engines and aircraft. All right, next slide. Uh, in the 70s, early 70s, we became a leader in the communications area um, based on a discovery that led to significantly improved traveling wave tube technology. So that's the part that's responsible for amplifying radio frequencies, um, giving new potential for majorly increased efficiency and expanded capabilities for communication satellites. So this area grew rapidly through the 80s and 90s. Uh, we launched the communications technology satellite as a test bed for this new technology and a new transmission frequency. So this, what it allowed was um, much smaller and cheaper ground receiving equipment. And it was, it was essentially the birth of direct broadcast TV. And because of this, we were awarded an Emmy in 1988 for technical achievement. And in 1993, we launched the Advanced Communications Technology Satellite that was the first high-speed digital communications satellite. And more recently, we've moved on to software-based communication uh, satellites. All right, next slide. All right, there's our guy, John Glenn. Uh, so in May of 1999, we are renamed once again to John H. Glenn Research Center at Lewis Field in honor of Ohio astronaut and Senator John Glenn. So we've actually, we've had five names over the course of our history. All right, next slide. So I'm kind of like gonna maybe awkwardly like fast forward and talk a little bit about, very little bit, where we are today because from a history standpoint, like if it's you know more less than 20 years old, it's not super historic yet. But um, you know, we've been building on these areas of expertise over the last 80 years, and here we have our six core competencies 
And I really hope you've heard from like the actual technical experts uh, this week to talk about some of these things and just, we're really just pushing the envelope tremendously. Um, you know, the ion engines, like the crazy endurance, um, astronaut safety, optical communications for spacecraft, um, hybrid electric aircraft, the shape memory alloys. And like kind of what I hope is that you, know, you can see these six competencies that we have today. And you know, I know we talked really fast for a really short time about what we've done, but like if you kind of recognize some of the things I've talked about today. Um, and that's that's why we do history at NASA, because it's context. You know, everything we do today didn't spring from a vacuum, right? So next slide. Uh, to illustrate this, I've got my very, very, very rough Glenn competency family tree. So everything we do today, you can trace back to this initial mission of like this humble piston engine, um, you know, and you know, that initial mission of just improve aircraft engines. You know, 80 years later, we're still trying to improve aircraft engines, but you can see we've had these kind of branches off of this where sometimes it's really direct um, and other times it's kind of those unexpected discoveries that lead you off into a different area. Um, but that's that's what's so cool about science and technology is like you, you push that domino and let it go and see where it takes you. So, you know, if the top row of what we're doing today, well, that's going to inform what we're doing 80 years from now. So that was the 10 cent super fast history of Glenn. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there if you want to know more. Um, there's a great coffee table book done for our 75th anniversary that's available online. It goes into way more detail, has beautiful pictures. Uh, my contact info is out there. So if you have questions, it sounds like there's not time for questions today, but please get in touch with me. I love to hear from people. Uh, because it is always an honor to talk about Glenn history, and um, it was a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. And I think I'm going to use this as a primer for next year's uh, organizing committee to really help us understand oh, more about things we should talk about. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, our event chairs, Marla Perez Davis, who is a center director at Glenn, and Steve Witowski the Moog Science and Defense Group Business Development and Strategy Lead, and AAS is Vice President of Finance. Marla, if you and Steve could activate your cameras and your audios, and go ahead and uh, give us any last words you'd like to say to our audience. Marla, Thank first. you. Okay, thanks. Um, good afternoon. I hope everyone is enjoying the um, uh, John Glenn Symposium. I have been um, listening to the uh, presentations and outstanding. Thank you so much, um, Jim Allen, for all the work. It has been another wonderful um, experience. And again, I thank you every single one of you for joining us in the past three days or you know two and a half days. So thank you so much. Um, it's been an honor. Steve. Steve. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Um, well, hey, I want to I want to thank you, Alan and, and Jim, and of course uh, I want to thank Marla for for helping out with uh, being co-chair on on this event. I thought it went really really well, uh, much better than uh, than I would say uh, our starter last year, and really looking forward to our event next year. Um, and I'd also like to thank the uh, the AAS staff. Uh, and uh, all the committee members who, who helped us put this thing together. It was uh, a, a good labor of love and, um, you know, uh, a lot of folks working really, really hard behind the scenes. You can see uh, the folks who worked on this on the, uh, the final page of, of, um, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the brochure and the program. So uh, I'd also like to just thank our, our session moderators and, and participants uh, for for uh, spending their days, the last three days with us, uh, bringing everyone up to date on, on what's going on on some of the great NASA programs and, and uh, especially some of the real cool technologies that are out there being uh, worked on and developed right now. Um, and I was really excited to see that we were able to get uh, this year, we had uh, the new administrator uh, who was able to do a keynote speak for us and also uh, 
um, Mr. Reuter, and um, that, that was super great. So, uh, and finally, uh, congratulations to our Macaulay winners. Uh, got to, was able to sit through their sessions. I thought that was, was really great and fun. Um, back to you, Alan. Hey, Alan, I um, also want to thank you all the sponsors. Thank you so much, uh, Steve um, and everyone. Thank you for your support. Greatly appreciate it. Couldn't, we couldn't do this thing without you know, your support. So again, thank you. All right, so great. Thank you guys very much. There are two people that I don't have on camera, but uh, I do want to point out, and that is Eric Kaler, who is now 14 days into his job as president of Case Western uh, University. So uh, he jumped in with both feet and uh, had to had to had to perform <laughs> in front of lots of folks. And then Ann Boshert. Um, Ann is the associate vice president of corporate relations, and uh, she has been an integral member of our team since the beginning, helping us put things together. And I'm really looking forward to seeing her personally next year when we come to Case Western for a live event uh, in 2022. So now I'd like to bring up the AAS staff. Uh, I'd like to bring Jim Way in. Jim is our executive director and he manages our staff and he manages all the coordination of uh, these events. And then we have uh, Kelsey Kedow. Kelsey, bring yourself up, please. There she is. Kelsey is our event coordinator and she's been doing a tremendous amount of the coordination uh, to get schedules put together and get all of our tech checks done and to work with the different entities having to perform this uh, event. And then Abigail Howard has just been on board for about a month. Abigail, maybe not even a month. How long have you been here? A little over a month. Okay. Abigail is our communications coordinator. And Abigail, I asked her a few minutes ago for a button pushing finger was getting sore. Like remember the Jetsons commercial, the country, uh, cartoon where he, George always complained about his button pushing finger being sore because he had to push a button so many times. Abigail has been running all the slides and all the videos and she's been coordinating all that real time and that's been super. So I'd like to thank the staff for everything that they've done for us and all the work they've done. Uh, you know, would y'all like to say anything, Jim, Kelsey, Abigail? No, just proud of the team. Uh, everybody did great. And thank you, Alan, for all your hard work and, and making this happen. Uh, you've been instrumental in it as well. And so we thank you very much. But Abigail, Kelsey, this is your first virtual event with AS, and you both knocked out of the park. So thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. And so it's time for our next session. Let's jump right into it. Jim Way is managing the session called Autonomy and Traffic Management. Look over to it in your menu and he'll be starting right now. <laughs> 